Well, for the benefit of people that did not tune in last week, and I would recommend that you uh, contact Archives on Audio and get the bulk of the two-hour, in fact, secure the two-hour and 15-minute conversation that I had with Farah Mansour. Uh, Farah Mansour, spelled F-A-R-A-M-A-N-S-L-O-R, is an Iranian national, a diligent and very courageous researcher and a member of the Iranian resistance who has uncovered a massive amount of documentation concerning a long-standing historical relationship between elements of the U.S. intelligence community and the Islamic fundamentalist community in Iran, which was tabbed early on by the U.S. national security establishment to be a successor to the Shah of Iran. Uh, Faro, we have all of your discussion on tape, and that's going into the record. Uh, why don't we attempt to do the impossible and very briefly sum up, for the benefit of new listeners, what we spoke about last week. If you could sum up the, the circular letter that you and colleagues have, have uh, distributed and uh, that we analyzed in detail last week. Uh, what we did discuss was that considering that Iran was a keystone of the U.S. strategic interest in the Middle East, we know that the Shah, after 1953, CIA engineered coup, was put in there to maintain the stability. And we also talked about uh, that in 1975, Richard Helms learned of the Shah's cancer, contrary to what generally is believed that Carter administration did not know <clears throat> about the Shah's cancer till very late 1978, 79. George Bush, through Richard Helms, learned of the cancer by 1975 at least by 1976 when he was a director of the CIA. And this knowledge was uh, used by the pro-Bush loyalists at the CIA and intelligence community in the United States to quietly prepare for the Shah's departure. And Carter actually did not know this and blindfully was uh, following his policy of the respect for the human rights. And... Uh, while that policy was going on, the pro-Bush faction of the intelligence community were pursuing their own private foreign policy to keep Iran intact and compass free. And to that end, we have talked that uh, they privately allied themselves with the Islamic fundamentalists of Khomeini. And that alliance promoted the Islamic Republic of Iran and engineered the hostage crisis. And the hostage crisis was used as a political management tool to achieve their objectives so that so-called crisis was a created crisis by them to consolidate Khomeini's control of Iran and that paved the way for George Bush and Ronald Reagan to gain to the White House by destabilizing President Carter. Right. We Now, of course, we went into infinite uh, an infinite amount of detail last week and so Correct. this is this is in a, a synoptic account but basically the the relationship between the islamic fundamentalists and the reagan and bush administration and the u.s national security forces a lot with them goes back way before the weapons deals that were conducted between the islamic fundamentalist government and the ali, ali north and company under the iran contra scandal that in fact the roots of this go not only back to the early 1970s when Richard Helms learned about the Shah's cancer, but in fact that they go back even farther. Uh, they go. They in fact we could perhaps trace the roots, the the development of that political philosophy all the way back to the first Shah, who was installed by the British in part at least to contain uh, the possibility of expansionism by the fledgling Soviet government. But we could perhaps trace the immediate roots back to 1956 when John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State and the brother of CIA Director Alan Dulles, who commanded the agency when it conducted the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, uh, we could trace the roots of this policy back to 1956, when John Foster Dulles uh, had some very interesting things to say in a book. Why don't you reiterate that uh, for us, Farah? Well, John Foster Dulles here said that the religion, and I quote, the religions of the East are deeply rooted and have many precious values. Their spiritual belief cannot be reconciled with communist atheism and materialism. That creates a common bond between us, and our task is to find it and develop it. Now, I believe that this statement is quite significant because that would give the embodiment to what really created the alliance between people within the intelligence community that they wanted to have one of their own men in the White House, 
and uh, the uh, Islamic fundamentalist headed by Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, to have that kind of uh, clear what we mean by that, it is important to point a few uh, elements over here that we probably have not covered in our last uh, uh, conversation. One is that when former CIA director Joe, I'm sorry, Richard Helms was the American ambassador to Iran from 19... 73 to 1976, he had two individuals working under him. One was George Cave of uh, Iran Contra fame, that we know of him, that he went to Iran in 1986 with uh, McFarland and Oliver North. But there was another individual from the State Department that was working with uh, Cave under. Richard Helms, and his name is Henry Precht, that is P-R-E-C-H-T. By 1977, Preck was put as a director of the Iran desk at the State Department. The reason that his position is very important, simply because, to many accounts, he was put in there as a choke point to see the uh, to control the flow of information from Iran to the State Department and from the State De Department to Iran, and a very close relationship was developed between Henry Precht and former Iranian uh, Deputy Prime Minister Ibrahim Yazdi that we talked about him, that who from uh, who was the uh, Khomeini's sole representative of the United States from mid-1975 all the way to end of 1978. And then after the revolution of 1979, he became Khomeini's deputy prime minister, later on the foreign minister. And he was the individual that George Cave provided a tremendous amount of uh, intelligence briefing. And this was during the Iranian weapons transfers, which came to be known to the American public as part of the Iran-Contra scandal. That's correct. Now, now but, by the way, but before we go on, far, why don't you spell Ibrahim Yazdi's name for us, for the benefit of people who were not with us last week? Very good. Ibrahim Yazdi's name, this is spelled uh, I-B, that's for the first name, uh, R-A-H-I-M, Ibrahim, and Yazdi is Y-A-Z-D-I. Okay. Go ahead. And now, we have to also remember something very ironic here, that up to January 14, 1979, President Carter did not authorize the official meeting between the, Khomeini, between the State Department or any American officials and the uh, uh, Khomeini's representative. However, on January 14, 1979, he authorized a meeting between Warren Zimmerman, who was a political counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Paris, and Ibrahim Yazdi. That is at the same time that General Hazard began to uh, encourage the Iranian military to establish direct contact with the, with the religious leader. On the same day, Khomeini, an interview with CBS, claimed that a great part of the army, Iranian army, were, were loyal to him. Okay, now what date was this exactly? That was on January 14th, 1979. Okay, so almost 10 months before the hostages were That's taken. correct. Okay. Now, there is a significant here. On January 16th, in the exact reversal of 1953 CIA coup, the, I call them the spoof network, ushered the centric and a weak Shah out of Iran, and the same evening, Yazzi confirmed to Warren Zimmerman a philosophy that it was compatible with that of John Foster Dulles that he just stated. And again, said, uh, I quote, yeah, go ahead. The Islamic movement was too strong to be taken by Bolsheviks. Yazzi also said that Iran had no better memories of the Russians than of the Americans. They would seek friendly relations with Soviet Union, but that process would be complicated by Soviet atheism, and anti-religious policy. 
at least Americans believe in God, which made it easier to maintain closer relationship. Okay. At the end of the quote. All righty. Now, <clears throat> now we see here that we were talking about the philosophy that originally was developed by John Foster Dulles. Now we see that right at the time that the Shah of Iran left Iran on January 16th, Right at that time, there is a conversation between Ibrahim Yazdi, who was the tacticianer of Khomeini's crowd, and who was Khomeini's representative in the United States, confirms to the official of American Embassy in Paris that how compatible their policy is with that of John Foster Dulles, that he was stated in 1950s. And who would, uh, what was the name again of the person that Yazdi was speaking to? Zimmerman, Warren. Warren Zimmerman. The first name is W A R R E N, and the last name is Z like in zebra, I M M E R M A N. He was a political counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Paris. Okay. Now, this is very, very, of course, very significant. Now, what we also have to remember is that during the Iran Contra affair. <clears throat> Uh, we find that something else, another name came out, and that name is Eric Van Marbot. I'm sure that, uh, David, you should be familiar with that name. Very much so. Yes. Eric Van Marbot was uh, uh, early 1981. He was forced to resign out of the State Department, and he was the man that actually... <clears throat> was representing the uh, the Defense Department for selling most of the armament to Iran. Now, and he was also that is was ironic also is this, go ahead. that uh, <clears throat> Eric Van Marbat made sure sometimes on February 2nd, 1979, that is exactly one day after Khomeini came to Iran, that he signed him a m <clears throat> excuse me, memorandum of understanding with the Iranians. This memo gave a power of attorney to U.S. over all Iranians' outstanding military contacts to have them restructured. And I quote, with, which proceeds to be cycled back into the trust fund to pay for other Iranian obligations as they come due. In another word, Eric von Marbot made sure that all payments for the alleged, you know, for the legitimate uh, paybacks or money earned through the ki kickbacks of all the uh, arms sale to Iran, which actually made for a good portion of the budget for the covert operation diversion funds were secured. This was a crucial deal that made the post-inauguration and subsequent Iran contra arms transaction possible. After signing this memorandum of understanding, and now again, what was the date of this memo? That is February second, nineteen seventy-nine. Okay. Now, so this is twelve days before the the initial occupation of the U.S. embassy in Tehran, in which uh, Kalani and his gang of CIA and Sabak trained Islamic fundamentalist uh, militants became the embassy guard, and uh, Kalani then. Uh, led the raid on the U.S. Embassy in November of 79. You're talking about uh, Mashallah Kashani. Kashani, excuse me. Excuse me, I don't have the letter in front of me. Why right. I brought this name of Eric Van Marbat? Mm -hmm. Because according to Gary Sick, he has stated in his book, All Fall Down, and I quote, referring to Eric Van Marbat, and he's praising him. He says, quote, one of the small band of genuine professionals whose depth of knowledge and experience provided indispensable continuity to the department through successive political administration in Washington. Close quote. He further commented that, quote, whatever the U.S. government was paying Van Marbat, and it was not princely, it got its money worth during those crucial days. Now, how did Dr. Sick remarks square with Van Marbot's involvement in Isco affair or his uh, job with uh, 
Frank Carlucci at Sears World Trade Transacting International Arms Deal is hard to imagine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now, you might want to go into the, the, a bit of the relationship between Von Marabad and Carlucci, because those are two people that have been involved in a number of different operations in conjunction with people like Richard Secord and many of the operatives that were grouped around Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple in the operation begun under the auspices of George Bush and Theodore Shackley at the Central Intelligence Agency. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay, now, what is important here, as you very well stated, <clears throat> is that Frank Carlucci was one of the CIA's most successful covert, uh, covert uh, operation experts. In February 1979, as we know, he was appointed by President Carter as Deputy Director of the CIA under Stansfield Turner. At that time, Carlucci was warned, by the way, about the trouble in Iran. Apparently, he did not listen, or he didn't want to listen. Uh, he was promoted to the post Deputy Secretary of Defense by the new Reagan administration on the very day of the inauguration. During the, his tenure at the Pentagon, General Seiko was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Eric Van Marbot was the Pentagon's ace troubleshooter, was the head of Defense Security Assistant Agency, DSAA, this is the agency which is actually the, the Pentagon's arm for cells division, and that's where all the transaction for armed cells to all the countries would take place. However, Secor and Van, Van Marbot were both in, investigated by the FBI and their role in the ESCO affair, and uh, Van Marbot suddenly retired uh, from the DSAA on December 1st, 1981. In early 1982, after the FBI investigation, well, as we know that Secor was suspended from his post, but Carlucci unilaterally reinstated him to his job at the Pentagon. Now, in 1982, Carlucci left the Pentagon to become the head of Sears World Trade. Mm -hmm. He hired, by the way, Eric Van Marbot as his primary consultant. As we know, in 1986, according to Sears, Roback and Companies, Chairman, I quote the statement that he has made that the subsidiary Sears World Trade, headed by Pentagon's designated National Security Advisor Frank Carlucci, has engaged in international arms sales since 1983. Now, what, when the Iran Contra scandal breaking the news, the Reagan administration once again chose to employ Carlucci's unique talent for damage control. So that's how. But the Washington's answer to Ed McMahon, he was uh, he had to have a long string, second, and on a position not actually usually subject to much public scrutiny. On March 31st, 1986, Reagan appointed him National Security Advisor to succeed Vice Admiral John Poindexter. Was it March of 86 or 87? I thought it was 87 that, that Carlucci was appointed. No, 1986. Okay, go ahead. Now, Reagan, having issued a directive that <clears throat> NSC members could no longer engage in a covert activities, ordered Carlucci to review all covert operations and propose changes in the procedure for approving and coordinating such operations. Uh, of course, who better than Carlucci to evaluate all those situations? Now, what what is important? I don't know whether your uh, uh, audience or your listeners know anything about the ISCO. Well, we have spoken about it in, in other programs. You have. Yes. So what is now also is interesting is to remember to have Frank Carlucci. To, I'm sorry, the Eric Van Marbot to sign that memorandum of understanding on February 2nd, 1979 is quite significant because that made Iran dependent on all the American-made arms at that time. And when the war between Iraq and Iran broke out, most of the armament that it was shipped to Iran was through the private sector, which it was the black market. Okay, now I have a question, Farah. <clears throat> this this February second seventy nine agreement. Yes. Uh, this between von Marabad 
and the and, and was it Yazdi who actually concluded this? No, no, no. There was a general there who was the head of uh, Iran's uh, uh, the military industrial complex, uh, whose name was uh, uh, General uh, Tufanian, and his first name is Hassan H A S S A N, and Tufanian is T O U F like in Frank, A-N-I-A-N. Okay, so it was this general that concluded the agreement with Farm Marbad, and Yazdi was the fellow who spoke with Ibrahim, or with Warren Zimmerman, and uh, that on January 16th, and indicated uh, a an intersection of purpose, perhaps we could say, between the Islamic fundamentalists and the U.S. That's correct. Now, also of important note here is that by the time when Khomeini came to power, and by the time when uh, General Vadi Karani, as we talked, became the Iran military chief of staff, he chose for himself a deputy. And that deputy was a man named Dr. Moji, M-O-J-I, and his last name is Taherzadeh, T-A-H-E-R-Z, like in zebra, A-D-E-H, as a deputy, and he became replacement for General Tufanian. Okay. Now, I promised last week that in our final session, I would have a very, very big surprise that I would leave that for another session. Dr. Tarzadeh was a nuclear physicist that in 1974 was sent to Iran who became later on the director of Atomic Nuclear Research Center of Iran, developed the Iran's atomic program. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman, by June of 1978, he resigned from his post, and by actually summer of 1978, he joined General Karani, and he, uh, he was very well connected with, of course, many of his good friends, in the United States that they sent him to Iran, and he became the director of the Iran military industrial complex. Now, this by itself is a very fascinating subject, which relates to the development of the nuclear program in Iran, that I will leave that for later on. But just to mention that Eric Van Marbat, after February 2nd, he left Iran, but left behind a tremendous amount of contracts existed in Iran that all were under the control of Dr. Moji Tarzadeh. Okay, now, <clears throat> a couple of questions that I have, uh, there are actually a question and, well, really two questions, I guess, far up. Well, you said that this agreement between Van Marbad and Mr., I've forgotten his name, how's it pronounced, beginning with a T? Too funny on. Too funny on. That this agreement made Iran dependent on U.S. arms. My understanding is that Iran had <clears throat> previously purchased most of its arsenal from the United States. I know that under the Nixon administration there had been tremendous arms shipments uh, from the U.S. to Iran. I was not aware, my, my impression was, now correct me if I'm wrong, that it was that the U.S., that Iran was already pretty much dependent on U.S. arms for their defense. Now, what, you, what you're saying would indicate to me that that was not the case prior to that agreement. No. The, you have to understand that this was all the existing contract that it was all restructured by Mr. Eric Van Marbot. Mm -hmm. The dependence on the uh, spare parts and dependence on the military supplies from the United States, it did exist all through the Iran-Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And all were basically made in the United States. That is why that, uh, according to Ari Ban Manaj, the amount of arms that it was sold through the black market uh, uh, dealers uh, came up to those deals that he went through Israel came up to somewhere about ninety billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, considering that Iran's military armament, they were all American made, it is of significance to understand that what. Mr. Eric Van Marbad was doing to make sure that that dependence on the U.S. supply of arms would 
continue even during the Khomeini's regime. I see. So what you're saying is that, that I, I misunderstood what you were saying, was that what Mar but the agreement with von Marbad assured that the, the dependence would continue. That's correct. Okay, because my understanding was that it, they were already pretty much dependent on U.S. arms. In fact, a company I used to work for in the Silicon Valley, uh, I used to help ship uh, F-14 spare parts to Iran. We had special markings. This would have been in the mid to late 70s prior to uh, the Shah's downfall. Uh, it, it's also worth noting, uh, Farah, that even though the October surprise has been roundly disclaimed by the so-called uh, working press in this country. I say so-called because an awful lot of them really don't show much evidence of doing any work. Uh, the New York, the America's newspaper of record, the New York Times, featured a story by Seymour Hirsch, which revealed that the U.S. Uh, and the Reagan administration had been transferring arms to Iran as early as 1981, which predated the previous disclosures. Uh, it would appear that this agreement between Tufanian and von Marbad on February 2nd of 1979 uh, laid the groundwork for the early arms transfers that were reported by Seymour Hirsch. That's correct. Okay, go ahead. Now, of the, another important issue that we also have to uh, remember is that we talked about two events. One was February 14, 1979, attack on the American embassy, and the second one was November 4th, which, in fact, the hostages were taken. Of a note here is that, important note, is that on December 24, 1978, also the embassy in Tehran was attacked unexpectedly during the ambassador uh, William Sullivan. At that attack was uh, uh, diffused because the ambassador ordered uh, to launch a tear gas grenade, later firing automatic weapon into the air, and that uh, really actually had the desired effect, and the crowd dispersed. The reason I'm bringing this up, because you have to understand, when the first attack came on the American embassy was on December 24th, which group of people, they came around the embassy and they decided that they would like to attack, and the ambassador Sullivan, he was not actually uh, hesitant to use some so sort of a tear gas response or tear gas grenade response to disperse the crowd. Now, also of significance is that on February 11th, which it was three days before the American embassy came under attack, that there, w there was another demonstration that it was uh, of attack on American installation that took place, that the chief of U.S. military assistant advisory group, which is called MAG, M-A-A-G, General, Major General Philip Gast, G-A-S-T, and his advisory group were trapped in the Iranian military command headquarters, and they were under heavy uh, arm attack. U.S. ambassador tried to contact the deputy prime minister, which at the time was Yazdi, and finally Yazdi and Ayatollah Beheshti, what we talked about him before, they came to his assistant and they went to the headquarters and they were able to get the release of General Cast and also other members of his mission. Now, of the significant uh, news here is that on that day, uh, during all these events that was uh, taking place, U.S. Deputy Secretary of the State Warren Christopher mm -hmm. and Under Secretary of the State David Newsom called Sullivan from Washington, D.C., on the behalf of Zbigniew Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. And this is stated in actually Sullivan's book, My Mission to Iran which uh, Sullivan comments, and I quote, I was particularly abrupt when I was told that Brzezinski wanted my views on the possibility of the coup d'etat by the Iranian armed forces to take over authority from what was clearly seen as a faltering Bakhtiar government. The total absurdity of such an inquiry in the circumstances then existing in Tehran provoked me to a scurrilous suggestion for Brzezinski that seems to shock mild manner under Secretary Newsom when he told me that was, uh, that he was not particularly uh, happy with my remarks and my remarks were not particularly helpful comment 
I ask whether he wishes me to translate it into the pol Polish and hang up the receiver. Now, close quote. Now, understanding that at that time, by 11th February 1979, Carter's administration were still trying to save the Shah's regime. And this is contrary to many of the Iranians and Americans <coughs> believe that it was Carter that undermined the Shah's regime and brought Khomeini to power. So what, what the, the significance of this passage from Sullivan's book would seem to be that it's indicating that at this point, even though Jimmy Carter was still officially backing the Shah, that already at this point uh, elements of the national security establishment and the State Department were looking beyond the Shah. Okay, go ahead. And at this point, they were already looking for a suitable replacement. And obviously, from the research that you've developed, that was the Islamic fundamentalist government. Yes. Now, on the February 14th, a day before that, on, uh, uh, which it was the 13th of February, uh, Sullivan announced that, I could I anticipated an attack on the embassy compound I could not say how it would happen, but I assume it would be in a form of a street mob that would that we would replicate what we experienced on December 24, which was the Christmas Eve. I expected that the mob would have weapon among them, and that we would face a serious emergency. Okay, now, so, now, Bob, but the, on February 11th, three days before the embassy was taken over, and that quote was on February from February 13th. This is February the, 13th. Uh, right now, on February 11th, though, you're saying that that uh, Mr. General Gast was actually attacked. His headquarters was attacked by the uh, so-called the revolutionaries, and then they were actually saved by Yazdi and Ayatollah Beheshti and. Those two individuals brought the general cast and also uh, this group back into the embassy. Right. Now, the, the point, uh, the reason I wanted you to reiterate that is that at this point, we're already seeing Islamic fundamentalists rescuing, not taking hostage, but rescuing uh, U.S. national security people in Iran. Go ahead. That's correct. But the <clears throat> important thing is this. You brought a very important point here. That is true. Because... That attack on the MAG headquarters was unpredicted. I mean, the mobs, they went over there, and Mr. Ibrahim Yazdi and Beheshti, everybody was over there to try to rescue the people because nobody wanted any of these military officers that they were doing the job over there to be harmed. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that this uh, February 14 attack was actually... Uh, a made-up attack with the specific objective, as we discussed last week, to neutralize the left and discredit the left so the Khomeini's regime could go after them and try to destroy them. Right now, as we recall, just for the benefit of listeners, last week in our discussion, on February 14th, 1979, there was an occupation, a takeover of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, which we, uh, Farah and I, have, have dubbed the St. Valentine's Day, Ma the Iranian St. Valentine's Day Massacre, after a famous organized crime killing in the United States. Uh, this massacre was blamed on the Iranian left, but was in fact conducted by Islamic fundamentalists, and it then later, as a well, not later, but as a direct result of this attack, uh, the uh, I forgot the individual's name beginning with K again. Kashani. Kashani. Okay, Marshala Kashani. Okay, Marshala Kashani, I'm confusing his first and last name. Uh, Kashani and a group of Islamic fundamentalists who were in fact working for the CIA and Sabak were placed in charge of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Uh, what was it, October or September of 1979, they formally relinquished their role as uh, guarders of... As, On uh, August 12, <clears throat> 1979. Okay. They, they ceased to be the people in charge of embassy security, but later it was Kashani who led the takeover of the embassy in November, on November 4th of 79, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, let's go back to something here significant. Mm -hmm. We talk about Henry, Henry Precht at the State Department. Mm -hmm. Now, he related in, uh, there's a statement that he talks about the February 14th incident. He says, quote, the Iranians believed that the United States had corrupted the political process in Iran, that the United States had put the Shah in power and maintained him there. 
believing that the new government feared that we would act quickly to overthrow the regime, I think that led to the first takeover of the embassy on fe February 14th, 1979. The government, the government wanted to see if we had any potential coup leader on the premises, close quote. Now, understanding one thing here, why this statement is important? Mm -hmm. Number one. He is referring to government wanted to see. Now, none of the Fedayan guerrillas or the leftists were in the government. So when he is talking about the government wanted to see, so that preclude any leftist guerrillas to be in the government. So if it was government, whether it was the government of uh, provisional prime minister of Iran, Mehdi Bazakhan, or was the Khomeini's regime, so that would not. Uh, say that it was any leftist guerrillas that they wanted to do that. That is official statement of the State Department by Henry Pratt. I'm a little confused, uh, Farah, about the, the significance of that particular statement. <clears throat> Could you repeat that and, and, and repeat your explanation of it, because I, I didn't follow that. You see, <clears throat> to explain this is very simple. It is generally believed, and even Ambassador Sullivan has claimed, that the attack on the 14th February 1979 was done by the leftist guerrillas known as Fedayan guerrillas. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. We know that the Fedayan and the leftist guerrilla, they didn't have any representation within the government of Bazargan, who was the provisional government. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, when Henry Preg is talking about that the people thought within the government, no, which talking government? about government of Mehdi Bazargan, okay. The, the government wanted to see if we had any potential coup leader on the premises, which mm -hmm. it means that the attack was done by somebody within the government, not the leftist guerrillas. Okay. You understand the significance now? So, so basically what uh, that statement by Precht is indicating is that the government of Iran was staging the, that the, basically the Islamic fundamentalist forces, I should say, were staging, were staging the coup uh, basically, in order to draw out of the woodwork any possible leftist elements that uh, m might offer the threat of coming to power in the future. That's correct. Okay. So that's why that <clears throat> they concocted this February 14th attack on the American embassy to discredit the left. And that's exactly what happened because the left, after that incident, was destroyed in Iran. Okay, and so what the significant of that is. So Precht's statement now, is indicating that this coup was intended, among other things, in addition to placing uh, Kashani and his company in uh, control of the U.S. Embassy, <laughs> uh, it also would have drawn out of the woodwork any leftist elements in Iran that might have offered the possibility of coming to power, so that, uh, in essence, that incident was, was operating in, in a way like a running dog to flush the game out of the bush, so to speak. That is correct. Okay, now, go ahead. I also would like to bring to your attention <clears throat> that... During all the time that Gary Sick in his uh, book, October Surprise, asserted about the agreement that it was reached between the Iranians and uh, Reagan-Bush uh, campaign, like uh, William Casey in Paris and Madrid, I disregarded that. And one of the other things that I found very disturbing that Gary Sick in his book, he has not mentioned anything about uh, General Garani's rule. He has not mentioned anything about the February 14th incident at the American Embassy. I had a conversation with Gary Sick on November 26, 1991, when he was being interviewed by <clears throat> uh, Carol Hemingway on the talk show in Los Angeles. I asked him to explain what his understanding of Garani's important role within the Bazargan and Khomeini's regime was, and he replied, I quote, I really do not know what his role was. I am not familiar with his actions on the February 14 taking of the hostages. I know that the hostages were taken. They were released after a relatively short period of time when the government intervened, and that was, in fact, the first taking of the hostages. Of course, the subject of the book, October Surprise, is the later taking of the hostages when they were held for 444 days. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are historical antecedents to all of these events, and it is true that you need to see it in a historical perspective. I, 
I did try to provide some historical background in the book, in the historical setting. Unfortunately, it is difficult to deal with the entire history of Iran in the background of this, close quote. That is by Gary Sick. The important thing is that if you don't understand what happened in February 14, 1979, when the crowd of Marshal Akashani were installed there by Ibrahim Yazdi, introduced to William Sullivan, American ambassador, as being the custodian of the security of the embassy compound from February 14 to August 12, 1979. How could you talk of the importance of the November 4, 1979 hostage taking? Hmm. So, what you're saying is <clears throat> there's a contradiction between what Gary Sick has written and what he said. He, he was saying that he would, didn't really understand uh, the role of uh, that particular coup and that, that, that he actually, that, that takeover. And uh, in other places, he indicates that he did understand it. That's, that's correct. Now, but he doesn't state that importance in any of his writings. That is what I am talking about, that unless if you go further back down the stream to find out exactly what was happening with the hostage crisis and you don't put any emphasis on what happened on February 14, it is very difficult to have a proper perspective of what was happening on November 4th and what was behind all that hostage taking on November 4th, 1979. Do I make myself uh, understood? Right. And what you're basically saying is that you doubt the veracity of some of Gary Sick's statements. We, we've, of course, gone over the significance of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the Iranian St. Valentine's Day Massacre, uh, last week. We've touched on it again this week. It served to discredit the Iranian left on whom it was blamed. It was actually conducted by Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, you've added a new dimension this evening by indicating that it also would have drawn out of the woodwork any leftist elements in Iran that might have had the possibility of coming to power, <clears throat> that in effect it was meant to draw them out so that they could be identified and destroyed, suggesting collaboration between uh, the CIA or the U.S. and the Islamic fundamentalist forces that placed Mashallah uh, Kashani in power along with his, his Islamic fundamentalist guards. They were in charge of U.S. embassy security until August of 79. And then it was uh, this very same fellow, Kashani, who led the embassy takeover in November of 79. That's correct. Go ahead. Now, also of significant is the role that uh, Mr. Henry Preck played within the State Department. Now, why this is important? Because it has appeared among many Americans that we really were taken by surprise when the attack on the American embassy took place on November 4th, 1979. In fact, on I would... second, 1979, Henry Prague sent a marked secret eyes only to Bruce Langen the U.S. charge of her at the American embassy in Tehran, mm -hmm. describes the U.S. policy towards Iran and admission of the Shah to the United States. It is in two parts. I will read the last part. I quote, We have the impression that the threat to U.S. embassy personnel is less now than in the spring, it's talking about February 14, 1979. Mm -hmm. Presumably the threat will diminish somewhat further by the end of this year. Nevertheless, the danger of hostages being taken in Iran will persist. So at this time, we know that the danger of the hostage taking does exist. We go on. Mm -hmm. We should make no move towards admitting the Shah until we have obtained and tested a new and substantially more effective guard force for the embassy. Second, when the decision is made to admit the Shah, we should qui uh, quietly assign additional American security guard to the embassy to provide protection for the key personnel until the danger period is considered over. Close code. Now, now we understand that this situation, it is quite clear in the State Department that the danger of hostage taking, it does persist. By, by the way, I would uh, interject at this point, Farah, that this interview, both uh, the part, the first part conducted last week and this week, are going to be going into the archives that I have, uh, in fact, in a couple of different places, 
One of the places they're going to be going into is as a supplement to Radio Free America number 31, a program that I entitled, and this was done in the summer of 1987, uh, a program that I entitled The Destabilization of the Carter Administration, which of course is one of the strategic goals of this alliance that we've been talking about the past two weeks.